comments. So please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so this lecture is going to be a little bit different in topic than some of the other ones. Um, in some sense, most of the other talks are about ends rather than means. So you have something you're interested in and you're kind of getting the results that you need in order to either detect an axion, as in some of the talks tomorrow, or to search for axions in the stars, as Georg nicely told us about. Um, this lecture is going to be a little bit different because uh, axion electrodynamics are very rarely the point. They're usually the means in which you're using to get to whatever point you want to make. Um, so because of that, the focus is going to be a little bit different. There are an insane number of ways you can solve classical, even just classical electrodynamics. I cannot go through all of them, apart from the fact that I'll give you flashbacks to your classes in ENEM, which I don't think any one of us wants. Um, it's just not practical because any way that you can use to solve normal electrodynamics, you can solve to so use to solve axial electrodynamics. Um, what I will do is go through a few of the most commonly used methods, which are kind of broadly used in different areas. And I'll also go through some of the most common traps that people fall into that cause errors to be made. Because while in some sense, I, almost everything I'm gonna talk about here could be done in a third year classical electrodynamics course, it's also very easy to underestimate how annoying electrodynamics can be. So there are lots of potential traps you can fall into um, if you don't take things seriously. So uh, I'm gonna focus down onto just one in part of the axion Lagrangian. So there's not going to be any discussion of the strong CP problem or anything like that. We're just going to focus on the interaction of the axion with some uh, photon. So the, the real point of all of this is going to be, well, that's not a nice sound, uh, this coupling here. So this also looks like E dot B. Um, and that's really how you're always gonna to want to think of the axion. Oh, this should be an axion here. So the axion is always going to interact with E dot B. Uh, we're not going to be talking about certain monopole or extended versions, this is just the classical axion electrodynamics that you will see in a lot of different papers. Um, so, and, and just to kind of, for kind of completeness, the electric field uh, you can get, of course, from the uh, vector potential and the normal potential. And basically all of the situations that we're talking about here, you probably don't need to worry about the scalar part of the potential. It's basically all vector potential. And there are some gauge choices you can make in all these cases that'll make that entirely accurate. But for the most part, just think E and A are more or less the same thing. And then B is just kind of the uh, cross product of A. Sorry, the divergence of the, uh, the curl of A. Um, so while I'll mostly be using the notation of GA gamma, uh, you'll also see in the literature uh, a dimensionless version of this. So you can also say GA gamma is basically, uh, this is just the fine structure constant over the uh, axion decay scale. So as Javier kind of pointed out in his previous lecture, uh, I think Andreas did as well, basically all the axion couplings are going to be proportional to one over FA, which is why uh, Georg called this kind of a one dimensional pr uh, theory in terms of parameters. Once you set FA, this sets the bulk scale for pretty much every other interaction. But then there is some part which is model dependent and this goes into this CA gamma, which is the dimensionless version. Um, and for the QCD axion, CA gamma uh, is proportional to some ratio of anomalies which depend on the model and some factor coming from mixing with the neutral mesons. So most of this comes from the mixing with the pion. This is usually called an order one number. If you try and work out the range of possibilities, even for the QCD axion, it can technically go between zero and like 100. So order one is the simplest and most cases, but you can make a really nasty choice of E over N, which is equal to 1.92. And because there is some theoretical uncertainty on this last digit, you can be within theoretical uncertainty of zero in the coupling. It's some weird conspiracy, it's very unlikely, 
but when people say this is an order one number, this is order one for the bog standard simple models that most people will use. Um, and there are lots of ways to solve this. Some of these will be very trivial for some situations and insanely complicated for others. Uh, so having a variety of them will come in handy because some things will just be either impossible or effectively impossible to do in some pictures. So the one I'll talk about the most and which is in my experience often the most broadly usable is just pure classical mechanics. You just write down Maxwell's equations and you solve Maxwell's equations using whatever trick you can find in the E&M book and steal and use on axioms. Um, but you can also look at this as some kind of quantum mechanical mixing picture. You can do quantum field theory. You can do thermal field theory, which is often very useful in astrophysical environments because it's, you're dealing with insane temperatures and lots of uh, medium effects. Um, I'm not gonna do all of those, especially thermal field theory would take way too long to explain how to do. Um, but I'll give some examples of classical and quantum field uh, calculations for this. So the easiest one to start with and the one that makes the most sense for the most applications, again, this is my bias, not everyone will agree with that, but it's hard to go wrong classically in a lot of cases, um, is just writing down the normal Maxwell equations. So if you just use the Euler-Lagrange equations, then you can basically differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to uh, d mu, a mu, and you can differentiate it with respect to a mu. The, and this will have to be zero. And this is just normal Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, so if you do this, then you get that the derivative of f mu nu is equal to your normal, uh, this is just your normal current, so uh, whatever electrons or whatever you happen to have in your system. And then you get kind of an axion current, which is f mu nu, then d mu a. So this is another way of seeing what Javier was mentioning earlier, that the axion only couples derivatively. If my axion has no derivatives here, there is no current. If there's no current in Maxwell's equations, nothing happens. Um, uh, I can also take pictures of these if people learn to write things down, um, but that'll have to wait till after. Very important trap here. This is not a real current. And by real current, I mean there are no moving electrons. So if I have vacuum, there are no electrons anywhere in the world. This still acts in Maxwell's equations. So you can't search for it just by saying, oh, I put down some kind of voltimeter. I, me I want to measure a current. This is a, a fake current. Uh, it doesn't see anything to do with matter. So all normal matter is in this term. All axion stuff is in this term. And we're not assuming any other axion couplings to matter. So basically, these do not talk to each other directly. The only way they can talk to each other is via the photon. Um, if you take basically the different components of these, you can write down the, the first two equations of Maxwell. So these are the inhomogeneous equations. So if you take the, the zero component, you get Gauss's law, which is just the divergence of E is equal to your uh, charges, and then you get the axion part. So this depends on the gradient of the axion, so the spatial derivative. And then you also get Ampere's law. So you have del cross B, not del cross del. Uh, and then now this is the vector current, so not the, the four current. Um, and then you get again an axion term. So, so far, this has not made any assumptions or anything like that. This is the, the full version of the Maxwell equations. You'll often see these are drop down. So this term here tends to be the most important in a lot of scenarios. So you'll often just have the temporal gradient, the, the time derivative of A dotted with a, well not dotted, but times a, a magnetic field. 
So this is because a lot of experiments will apply an external magnetic field and that'll select out this particular term. This, this is here. This is just B times A. So A is a scalar, so it's just multiplying the vector of B. Um, and I'm trying to mostly put the little arrow things over vectors, but occasionally I'll, I'll forget one. Um, a, so A has a dot over, sorry, when, two different versions of dot. Time derivative of A, yes. Dot product, no. Um, so this seems like we've run out of Euler-Lagrange equations. So how do you get the other two Maxwell equations? These actually come from something called the Bianchi identity. So basically, if I take, it's, a, it's basically a geometric uh, condition. So as, as long as you just have one vector potential, this always applies. Conversely, if you want to have magnetic monopoles, you actually t need to have two vector potentials. This was related to a lunch discussion we had. Um, and then these will give you your remaining Maxwell equations, which do absolutely nothing different. Ugh. I'm very sorry about the chalk. Um, so, for completeness, you can also write down how the axion equation of motion looks. So you can also write down Euler Lagrange from, for the axion, and then there's just a double dot minus uh, the Laplacian of a plus a mass term. So an axion term is sourced by e dot b. Um, this is very relevant in some settings, like lining, lining, shining light through wall experiments. It's very unimportant from most dark matter searches and things like that. So either you will very much care about this equation or you'll basically ignore it. Um, that's handy. So, so far nothing, this should be especially surprising. This is just what you have to do to write down the Maxwell equations. And in some sense, you could end this lecture here and say, go solve those. Um, turns out, for all generality, that's really hard to do, and so far as they're impossible to do. Um, but for a surprising number of the actually interesting situations, you can make assumptions or simplifications that make this quite tractable. This has a very faint dot. Sorry, this chalk is not the best. Um, so, the other thing that Georg mentioned earlier today was that medium effects are generally very important. Um, the way to handle medium effects in this is usually uh, to write down what people usually call the macroscopic equations. Again, this should all be familiar but potentially forgotten in the last time since you did electrodynamics. So basically what you do is you split your charges into what are called free charges and bound charges, and you do the same for your current. Where we have kind of, there are technical ways in which you can do this precisely, but heuristically, anything that's just bound in a medium, those are going to be called your bound charges and bound currents. Anything that is ex applied external to that is going to be called the free charges and free currents. Um, so basically, these allow you to define uh, the kind of macroscopic fields. So the displacement field and your extra magnetic field. And these are what are going to absorb these bound charges in order to write them out of Maxwell's equations. So this is an entire linear thing. You're just taking this current, you're splitting it into two parts, and then you're absorbing it into the rest of your definitions. Because of that, it doesn't affect the axion term, and it doesn't affect the homogeneous equations, because it's a, it's a purely just a linear redefinition of things. So this, 
gives you your kind of final Maxwell equations. And everything else is the same because I've only got enough extra charges here to absorb into these two left-handed parts of the, the Maxwell equations. So basically what that tells you is that the axion does not have anything to do with the matter. The only thing that sees matter is the photon and the axion basically just sees photons. So generally speaking, when you're trying to solve these equations, there'll be two main limits. So there'll be non-relativistic uh, solutions, which are almost entirely reserved for heliscope experiments. So basically, axion dark matter is the non-relativistic component of axions. So anytime you're searching from it, you'll generally say, well, I don't care about these spatial gradients of the axion. They're very small. So I'm just going to worry about the time component derivative. Um, the other case is when you're dealing with relativistic axions. So you talk, heard Georg talk about that a lot. Um, so this happens in astrophysical environments, in helioscopes, in light shining through wall experiments, things like this. So the mass of the axon may not be negligible, but it'll be not the main component of the energy. You'll have a lot of momentum around. So well, I mean, I'm definitely going slower than I thought I would. Um, for the non-relativistic case, um, what you'll normally do is you'll apply some external magnetic field, which you're going to call BE. And then that's basically going to linearize your equations. So you don't worry about the back reaction of your electrodynamics onto the axion field. The axion is treated as some big background. And you don't worry about the back reaction of any generated fields on this external magnetic field. So uh, in that case, you can basically just write down using this new version of Ampere's law that the axion-induced electric field is basically just going to be GA gamma. So where this epsilon is basically just defined so that epsilon times E equals D. So if I have some infinite medium, this is what you would expect the axion to generate. So in, if I apply some external magnetic field, I'm going to generate some uh, axion-induced electric field. So the thing I did in this, which is extremely egregious, is that I did not include any boundary conditions. Almost every single case where you're dealing with non-relativistic axions, boundary conditions are going to dominate everything. If you neglect boundary conditions while trying to solve these equations, you will go from just getting the wrong answer to a zero answer. So it's, it's extremely important. And there's been a lot of cases in the literature where these things have been neglected. So, to give you kind of an example, uh, one of the experiments you'll hear a lot about is called the cavity heliscope. So I'm going to steal a calculation of Javier's. Um, so this is originally produced by Pierre Sikivi, but that paper is very hard to follow. If you want to read a, a, an actual derivation of this, I'd suggest this paper. <coughs> but in this, you can imagine a cavity is basically some object where I restrict my modes in the system to be cavity modes. So there's only going to be the resonances in this system. So I can write down my electric field as some sum over the, uh, the different modes of the system. And then I'll just write down the amplitude as EI and then the spatial component of the mode. So you basically can just project any electric field onto your cavity modes. Um, and then you should define these and so that they perform a, like a nice basis set. So if you integrate over the cavity volume, I just get the cavity times delta IJ. And I'm going to say that these independently solve Maxwell's equations. So if I neglect the axion, I neglect any losses, these should solve Maxwell equations, um, which is basically just saying they solve the Helmholtz equation uh, which you can kind of verify for some simple cases. So if I try and then calculate what electric field is produced in my system, so this is all in vacuum, so you can just take these equations, then I can write down a wave equation by basically subbing 
one of my Maxwell equations into the other. So your, this, is, this is something which you do quite a lot, but you can write down some arbitrary excitation of this cavity as basically the, uh, the Laplacian of E plus some time derivatives. Then there's going to be a driving term, which is related to the axion. So the axion is gonna try and drive this cavity with some frequency given by the axion mass. And then there's going to be some loss term associated with the fact that uh, this cavity is not going to have an infinite resonance. There's going to be some resistive losses in the system. And then I can use this relationship to basically project out onto my cavity modes. So if I do that, then I can basically replace, when I put this project onto this Laplacian, I can use the Helmholtz equation to get the, the resonant frequency of, this, of a particular mode. And then I can solve for the, how the axon will drive that mode. So you get, and again, now these are the amplitudes, not the, the spatial part. It's just saying, how much do I drive this mode? So this is all just normal physics. And then you have the axion driving term. Uh, so when I'm doing this projection, when I'm using this, this integral relationship, sorry, not delta V, the integral dV. Uh, so if I integrate over all of space, I should get the volume. If I use that same projection, then I can define this, which is usually called a form factor. So I define it so the best it can be is one. Basically, I take out the, the the parts that have dimension. And then I have an integral over my magnetic field dotted with the cavity mode. And that's just coming from the fact that the, the axion is always producing something in the shape of the, of the magnetic field. So you can see here that there's a resonance when my axion is driving the system at the cavity frequency. And on resonance, what you uh, let's do this. So on resonance, what you can see is that the electric field is just proportional to the axion coupling so that's GA gamma times the amplitude of the, the magnetic field times the axion over the loss term uh, times this form factor. So basically, how well does your mode couple to the axion and then how strong is your axion-induced electric field? And it's going to be limited by the fact that your medium can't resonate uh, up to infinity. It's going to be limited by some loss. If you want to calculate the power, then the power is basically just related to the loss rate times the stored energy, which is like the integral over E squared. Yes? Uh, what is? G, so G is you sometimes called a form factor or an overlap integral. Um, so it's basically just the overlap of the field that the axion would like to excite. So the axion's driving term you can see is basically ma times g, which is, these are all constant, but the spatially varying part is the magnetic field. So it really wants to drive something in the shape of the magnetic field, which is usually kind of constant over these systems, but the mode itself doesn't have that shape. So this projection is basically just saying the amount that a cavity can drive it is related to the overlap of these two different modes. Um, if I had a, a, a system where my electric field perfectly matched the B field, E dot B is perfectly maximized and it can drive it perfectly. Um, so this will allow you to write down, this is a very famous formula when you're looking at axion detection, but basically that the power is proportional to the quality factor times the coupling squared 
times the magnetic field squared times this form factor. Sometimes this will be defined so you don't have to square it, but these are kind of minor differences, um, times the volume and the density of axions, where this Q is equal to basically the ratio of the frequency of the, the loss. So it's how much you can ring up the cavity. Um, Yes. So this is you. Yeah, basically, it's a, this is kind of a definition. You can you can you can show this explicitly. The quality factor is defined as uh, the frequency times the energy uh, stored in the system divided by the power out of the system. And if you solve and you write down the power out of the system in the right way and you, solve, you write down the energy stored in the right way, you can show that this will hold. Um, the exact order in which you do these things, you have to be careful if you're using the power to define gamma and things like that, but it's all self-consistent. Um, so again, all of this is just kind of standard electromagnetic techniques you're just driving a cavity with some effective current, and then you're projecting out onto modes. Um, and this is the general way that non-relativistic things are handled. They can also just solve Maxwell's equations directly, depending on the symmetries of the system. There, there are a number of different ways. Um, in the non-relativistic case, uh, the gradient of A is not zero. Um, but I'm going to kind of assume that you are still got some applied external magnetic field. You don't need to do that, but for all the cases I'm going to be looking at today, I will. Again, you, it's not qualitatively different to not assume that, you just have to follow slightly different maths. So there's still going to be, B is some external magnetic field. So if you want to do the simplest case, I mean, you don't have to do the simplest case, but you can write down a general wave equation. Again, by basically subbing Maxwell's equations into each other, you get the, the inhomogeneous Helmholtz equation, which is just a wave equation. Um, but you can write down that you get some normal equation for the axion. So this is the same one that I wrote before. It's just the axion is going to get excited by some e dot b. And then you can write down this generalized wave equation. Also, I'm really, I'm sorry about the noises of this chalk. Um, so generically, this can be not too trivial to solve because this, depending on the matter effects, this can be strongly anisotropic, you can get other weird effects occurring, but it's not too hard to just write down a simple example. And this is gonna lead into one of the cases that Georg showed just before. So if I just take the simplest case, I want a photon traveling in the X direction. So its momentum is going to be K in the X direction and it's going to be traveling perpendicularly to some applied magnetic field. Again, these are just the simple cases. You can generalize this. It just makes the maths more annoying. Um, so this is just the mixing of a transverse photon with an axion. So you can split up this equation into two components. So you can write down basically the component for the axion and the component for the photon. So for the axion, you have its normal in medium, sorry, it's normal dispersion relation. So this just says the axon is a normal massive particle. And similarly, the photon has the normal photon dispersion relation. Uh, I'm assuming that mu is one here. But then there's also some mixing between the two, which is related to the applied external magnetic field. So, I've written this down into, a, into the vector potential, but it's more or less the same as the, the electric field up to some phase and uh, frequency. 
Um, so now I've written down something which is just a kind of two component mixing equation. Uh, if I want to solve for the propagating states, I need to find the, the eigenvectors of this matrix. And they'll tell me what states are going to propagate in sync with each other. Um, so there are two different states you can solve. So I'll call this a transverse. Um, so the first is what you would call axion-like. So this has the dispersion relation, which is mostly that of the axion. So it's going to be mostly a photon, uh, an axion state, but a little bit of an interaction state of the photon, and vice versa. There's going to be a state which looks like a photon mass state, but has a little bit of the interaction state of an axion. So the dispersion relation is unchanged at lowest order. So for everything I'm going to do, it's going to be to lowest order in GA gamma, but you can do this to higher orders. You just have to be very self-consistent about what order you're expanding to. Um, so if you write down this uh, propagating state uh, in terms of, basically you can think of this, these are the interaction states, and then this combination is going to be the propagation state in the base of the, of the interaction states. So this should be familiar from any other kind of mixing problems you might have come across before. Um, And similarly, I'm also going to get a photon-like state, which just has uh, epsilon omega squared equals k squared. So this is, again, just the normal photon dispersion relation. And then it's going to be reversed. So instead of being mostly uh, I have mislabeled this. This is the <laughs> photon one. Sorry. I, I read them in the wrong order. So you can see this one is mostly the photon, a little bit of the axion. The other one is mostly the axion and a little bit of the photon. So you can see there's two things that are interesting here. One of them is that even when you're in these propagating states, you say a propagating axon will generate some small electric field, uh, and vice versa, a propagating photon will generate some small axion field. The other thing is that there is a resonance. So if these two match, then I'm going to have a resonantly produced uh, photon or a resonantly produced axion, depending on which way it's going. Um, this happens for a plasma. If I put in n squared equals 1 minus omega p squared over omega squared, which is the normal, the kind of the simplest dispersion relation for a, uh, a plasma, then this happens when omega p equals ma. So this happens a lot in astrophysical environments. Um, in fact, this is the exact same thing that was used by cast. You, you saw earlier... Uh, how Gilg was talking about how they extended the range of cast. It was exactly through this kind of matching. Um, this is a very important point. If you're trying to convert propagating axion states to propagating photon states, you must either match the dispersion relations, so you can match energy and momentum at the same time. This is the same as this resonant mixing. Or you have to break translation variance. Otherwise, conservation, conservation momentum will never convert between the two. So if you have some process which is converting between the two and it doesn't do one of those things, this is a red flag. It's, something is very wrong. Um, so how are we doing for time? So to give an example, so uh, Georg, just before, uh, showed <coughs> Uh, an example of this mixing phenomena occurring uh, between 
axions and photons in some kind of plasma medium. So we can imagine a scenario where you have some changing medium and at some region in that medium, the photon mass, the plasma frequency is going to match the axion frequency. And you might want to work out how many axions are going to get converted to photons in that region. So this can occur in something like the magnetosphere of a neutron star, um, you know, in this, this kind of situation. Uh, and this is the case where this mixing picture can be very powerful. So we're going to take uh, the case where this plasma frequency has some small, slow change to it. So it's mostly constant over large scales, but it's going to be slowly changing. And we're going to keep everything else so it's transverse and simple and there's no other problems. So you can write down this, this wave equation. So basically, the, instead of writing down these k's, you can keep in mind that k's should always be telling you that that's a spatial derivative. And frequencies, again, they're always a temporal derivative. So I was a bit lazy when I was writing down k here. k is, would be the spatial derivative for a plane wave. Um, if I keep it in general, then I can write down this wave equation. So it's just the transverse wave is going to be changing with the frequency uh, and some axion driving term. And then there's going to be a term which is related to uh, the dispersion relation of the photon. So basically the frequency minus the plasma frequency. Um, to solve this, what you can do is you can basically write down this complex electric field as a plane wave with some envelope. So you're going to be, able, basically you're saying if it's going to be something like a plane wave where the amplitude evolves. And this is usually something called the WKB approximation. So you can use it when the wavelength of the axion is much smaller than every other scale in the system. So basically when uh, K times this, this transverse field is much uh, bigger than the, the rest of the derivative. Um, so to write this down, you write down, you can write down the full e expression as some envelope term, which I'll give a tilde, and then times that by a plane wave. And I can do the same for the axiom. So doing this allows you to linearize this equation. Basically, nonlinear equations are really hard. Linear equations are much easier to solve. Um, so, oops. So, yes? Here? So this should technically, technically have a tilde on each of them. Sorry. Oh, x, sorry. A conversion error of my, the paper I was using this from used Z, and the rest of my notes were using X, so I, you know, uh, occasionally get a little bit muddled. Uh, changing notation is the worst. Um, so you can linearize this full wave equation to basically just the first derivative of this envelope with respect to the propagating direction X. Um, and then that's approximately equal to the rest of it. Uh, to get this MA, I also had to sub in the dispersion relation for the axion. So we're basically assuming that the axion behaves like a normal axion. Um, this is still not very easy to solve but you can solve it with something called a stationary phase approximation, which is basically just saying uh, when you're on resonance, that's going to be when you match the plasma frequency to the regular frequency. Outside of that, these things are going to dephase very quickly. So you can basically just take the part of it which is related to the area which the phase of the system is basically constant. And that is going to be proportional to basically how fast 
this plasma frequency is changing. So if you write that down, you can basically write down your electric field after some conversion length as something which is relatively compact. Where now this prime derivative is the derivative in the, this, the x direction. So you can basically kind of think of this as something like an L squared. So this is something like the conversion length. Uh, oh, sorry, these aren't squared yet. Uh, this you can think of it as something like a, a conversion length. Um, and then the probability of axions converting to photons is just the ratio of the energy densities. So how much of my energy density did I take away from the axion and put into photons? Um, so far, everything I've done is classical. This one kind of looks quantum mechanical because I was talking about mixing and I was talking about conversion probabilities, but I didn't actually take any steps there that were not just classical equations of motion. Um, so what would you actually have to do to deal with this in a quantum mechanical way? Um, first off, I should say that this discussion of interaction states and mixing and stuff like that does actually follow through. You can define these things as the quantum mechanical interaction state and the quantum mechanical propagation states and things like that because they're not, it, it's just a question of labeling. So classical physics, these are just purely labels. Quantum mechanically, you're, you're just saying that uh, the thing that's going to control my masses and my dispersion relations and things like that, those are my propagating states. Um, and the interaction states are defined by the things that would occur in the free Lagrangian without any mixing. So it all follows through perfectly, even though I technically didn't do anything quantum mechanical here. Um, if you want to think about a purely quantum mechanical question, you could say, I don't want to deal with electric fields, I don't want to deal with any of this kind of stuff, I just want to calculate what's the probability of an axion converting to a photon. Uh, depending on which background you come from, that might be a preferable way of thinking. Um, I should note there are some subtleties here. One of them is in the question between what do you mean by a photon, what do you mean by an axion? So when I'm talking about of an axion and a photon, I'm talking about propagation states, essentially. Um, if I have an axion that has some photon interaction state, then I'm not gonna get a conversion occurring, but it'll still produce a small electric field because it's a mixed state, but in the interactions. But if you actually wanna say, I wanna get a propagating photon out, and this is a very well-defined question. Um, again, there's a nice paper with Georg that goes through this kind of stuff in more detail, but this will give you like the sketchy outline. So the decay rate or the kind of the inverse lifetime of an axion going to a photon uh, is basically just kind of Fermi's golden rule. So you get some sum over the, the possible final states times the matrix element squared and something that says the energy should be conserved. So the energy, I'm not consuming any time dependent effects here. The energy of my axon is gonna go fully into the photon. You do need to be careful with how you normalize and how you define all of these states. Uh, technically in this section, the electric field I'm gonna talk about does not have the normal units of electric field. If you want to know about this stuff, you can look at the paper, but basically there are some funny definitions of normalization that guarantee that an axion has an one unit of axion energy per normalization volume and a photon has one unit of photon energy per normalization volume. But you have to be care to make sure that these things are the case. So in terms of, if I was writing down a kind of a Feynman diagram, this is, you have an axion coming in, have some external magnetic field being applied, and I have a photon coming out. Um, and if you wanna write down this matrix element, uh, which essentially comes from the Hamiltonian, so you can write down the, turn this Lagrangian into a Hamiltonian, you can work out what the 
uh, interaction term is. Um, ignoring the fact that I put in some funny normalizations, where V is some normalization volume, so it's basically the volume over which I define there to be one axion, uh, which is a little bit arbitrary. So then I have to put in an axion uh, wave function, and I'll just assume the axion is some plane wave with momentum P. So this is like the axion wave function. Then I've got my normal B dot E. So I've got an exter applied external magnetic field, and then whatever the wave function of my photon is. Um, so, to take a very, and this is, this thing here is also sometimes called an overlap integral. So it turns out you can use this in the same way that this form factor came about. Uh, it's a lot faster to write it down this way than the classical version, but this is a very generic kind of form. And you can see it just coming from the quantum mechanical definition. Um, So we can also do an example with this. So you saw in Georg's lecture uh, the example of a helioscope. So you've got some axions coming in. Uh, they're coming in all nice and parallel from the sun. There is some region of, say, length L, where you have some external magnetic field. And then I want to calculate the conversion into a photon after that. Um, so. This case is actually quite easy to do in this situation. Um, my photon wave function is just a plane wave. I just want a regular traveling photon coming out of one of the sides. So in this particular normalization, I can write down its momentum k. And then my matrix element is just given by uh, the difference term between the two plane waves, assuming that you've aligned your polarization with the magnetic field. So their Q is basically K minus P. And these are all vectors. Um, you have to be slightly careful. There are two possible directions of the photon. So the one that's actually most interesting, what you might call forward scattering, so the axion converts to a photon traveling in this direction, but there's also technically a probability that you produce a backscattering photon. So the fact that you break translation variance by having some finite thickness means that you could bounce a photon back. We're not gonna really worry about that one because it's dramatically less likely than the other one, uh, but in principle that it exists. Um, so now I just need to do this integral, and this integral will then basically go between minus L over two and L over two, because my magnetic field is zero everywhere else. Um, and you can do this, and you get something that's starting to look a lot like the result that Georg showed earlier. So you still have some uh, length scale around, but now you'll, you get this sign of Q L over two over Q that you might be familiar with. Um, to convert this into a prob probability, you basically have to turn this sum over final states into uh, basically L over two pi. So this comes from transforming the, like, the sum version of this into an integral version and then using the uh, Dirac delta function to basically set your photon momentum equal to the axion, sorry, your photon uh, frequency into the axion frequency. Um, if you want to get to the decay rate, this is actually equal to one over this normalization length times the probability. So the way to think of this is, this normalization volume was in some sense arbitrary, but it's also, you can think of it as a number density. I've said that there is one photon per some characteristic length. So if I want to have more photons per 
characteristic volume, that turns it into a, a number density. And if I want to work out the probability, I, I just need to get rid of that. Um, so you get exactly the probability of axion to photons is all squared, uh, which you might have seen. And then you can go to this limit of Q, L is much, much less than one to get the, the formula that Georg wrote down. So again, it's, it's not a particularly difficult result, but you can see how uh, in this quantum mechanical picture, it becomes very easy to write it down. Whereas classically, you have to be a little bit more careful about how you set up the problem. It's not saying you can't solve this classically, you can absolutely solve it, but certain pictures just lend themselves very easily to some calculations and otherwise. So this is why it's useful to have some kind of flexibility with these things. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so in this language, I haven't neglected anything. I just, just set up my problem in a way that they were zero. So by aligning my magnetic field perfectly with the photon and having no uh, dispersion relation for the photon, so basically having no non-trivial anisotropies or anything like that, I separated out the different modes that they don't talk to each other. So the transverse photon aligned with the magnetic field doesn't talk to the transverse photon unaligned with the magnetic field. And I haven't put in a medium in this particular calculation, so there is no longitudinal photon. Um, if you're doing this, like this calculation as before of the, the mixing uh, is an example where if you want to do this in practice, all of those things are not true. So if I want to deal with a real neutron star, they are hugely anisotropic because the magnetic field basically forces electrons to only move along the magnetic field lines. And then because that anisotropy doesn't match the incoming axion direction, you end up with mixing between your different photon modes. And you do have to handle that very carefully. Um, but for this lecture, I wanted to have simple examples, so I kind of set up each of the examples I did to have the nicest symmetries and the most compact answers. Um, but in general, that is something you have to be careful of. Um, so the other question that you might have is, when should I do a quantum mechanical calculation and when should I do a classical calculation? Um, in the vast majority of cases, the classical calculation, the quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical calculation will give you the exact same answer. So the answer to that question is whichever is more convenient for you at the time. The only cases where this doesn't work is when you're asking a non-classical question and you have a non-classical state involved. So um, to give you a kind of sense of that, here I calculated an actual probability. So this is a QFT calculation. This is a probability of axions converting to photons. In other cases, I used P for power. I said there is some power radiating in from my cavity in axions, sorry, in photons. Um, this will give you the same answer as long as you're just asking a question that's like that. What is the average power I would expect from this system? If you ask a question that is very funny like, how many photons are in N state, then you have to be careful and use quantum mechanics. Otherwise, things like stimulated emission, things like that, will generally just fall out, especially for, well, for axion photon conversion, they will almost always fall out. Um, for the most part, classical will give you a perfectly good answer and is often simpler to do for certain calculations. Um, uh, if anyone's curious and I have time at the end, I can give a small proof of that. Um, oh, yes. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Yes, so uh, sure. So this is an example of the kind of thing which does not work. Um, and I can give you from this, I can show you an example which potentially could work. So there are two broad requirements to have a chance of this being non-classical. I need to be asking an inherently non-classical question. I need to be having an initial state which is inherently non-classical. Um, so here's an example of having a, classic, a non-classical state but a classical answer. So if I have my Hamiltonian, it's going to look something like I am creating an axion and destroying a photon, or sorry, vice versa. I'm yeah, creating axion and destroying a photon, or I'm destroying an axion and creating a photon. Uh, there's going to be one, some combination of these processes. There'll be other things as well, but everything will be proportional to some creation and annihilation operators. Um, if I want the total rate of axions going to photons, I'll need the decay rate of axions going to photons minus the decay rate of photons going to axions. So if I try and do some kind of stimulated emission, what you see is that you have Na minus one, so I've destroyed an axion, and gamma plus one, I've created a photon, times your creation annihilation operators, and then my initial state will have some number of axions, some number of photons. And then I'll get the reverse. I can also create an axion and destroy a photon. So in this case, this is just proportional to N A and gamma plus one minus N A plus one and gamma, which is just N A minus N gamma. So if you were turning that into an expectation value, you would say the power you would expect is exactly the classical one where you don't get any stimulation factors. But if I asked a much more complicated question, for example, I have exactly n equals four photons, and I have perfectly that state, and I ask what is the probability to transition to an n equals five photon state, then I don't have this back reaction. So you will get basically your expectation value if this is like four photons, five photons, three photons, I am slightly more likely to create a, a photon than I am to destroy a photon which is the same as saying my expectation value is that I will slowly increase the number of photons. But this is still Bose enhanced, technically. There are other problems with these kinds of measurements and I think the noise will also get Bose enhanced, but you could construct, if you have a non-classical initial state, you could construct situations where you are asking really non-classical questions. But for the most majority of questions you're interested in, which will basically be like the average power, it doesn't matter how non-quantum the initial state, sorry, non-classical the initial state is, you'll still get a, the classical answer as the expectation value. Um, so most of the time you're free to switch between pitches and it's all fine. In fact, there's a very nice paper by Georg and Leo Sadolsky that basically says for this, uh, particle to boson boson conversion, the expectation value will always be the classical result. So even if you don't actually have a large number of photons, you can still use the classical calculation to give you the expectation value. Um, so to give you kind of further proof that these things all agree, I can do an example in three different ways. So well, these three different pitches. The maths is very similar for all of them. Uh, we can take, uh, and please do interrupt if you have any questions about this. So the rest will just be a series of three examples. So if you have any questions about the kind of more foundational aspects, please don't hesitate to ask. Good. 
I'll also mention that there are not only three ways of doing these kinds of calculations. It's just I don't have infinite time to try and do infinite different ways of solving electrodynamics. Um, the other way of doing all of this is put it into a computer with a finite element solver and it will do it for you. Um, which is very useful in situations where you do not have symmetries. Um, so the simplest experiment I could think of, which is still a, a practical experiment, uh, is one that Javier and Jörg Jekyll proposed, which is called a dish antenna. So a dish antenna is basically a metal mirror, and then I'm going to want to convert some axions into some photons, and those photons are going to be detected by some kind of antenna. So in some sense, it's the simplest possible system. My entire system is I have a mirror. That's it. So the first way of doing this is you can just think of it as the axon is a classical background field. I have here the EA of the axon is zero because the dielectric constant of a mirror is like minus infinity, so essentially there's no axon-induced electric field here. My axon-induced electric field in the vacuum is just GA gamma BE times A. And then here I'm not even, I'm not worrying about mixing, I'm not worrying quantum mechanics, I just have two different classical electric fields. That's it. Um, on this boundary, which I'll call x equals zero, you have to be careful because Maxwell's equations also have boundary conditions which don't change when you add in the axion. So you have the parallel E and H fields. So the electric field in region one has to be equal to the electric field in region two and not H, parallel. And the same thing for the H magnetic fields. I can never remember what you call it. It's one of them's called the magnetic strength and the other one, yeah, the H one. Uh, is also parallel across the two, uh, conserved across the two. Um, this solution obviously does not respect this. I have zero and I have something that's not zero. Um, the only thing you can do is to add in a solution of the free Maxwell equation, so basically a propagating wave, and use that to match the boundary conditions. There's no other degrees of freedom to play with. So I want to have some E photon. So my E axion, which will be, say, going up here, is going to get canceled at the mirror by this E photon. So then I can see that if this is uh, my E photon has to be minus E A times the, uh, some plane wave. Maybe the minus is the wrong way around. I, someone will have to check. Uh, which is just minus G A gamma B A. So this is just sold to my electric field. If you want to work out the power per unit area of, a, uh, uh, of an electric field, you should use the, the cycle average pointing vector. Um, so this guy is basically just a half times the real part of the electric field uh, across the real part of H. Now there's an important subtlety here. If I'm including the electric field, I should also include the axial induced electric field. Because if I'm talking about somewhere over here, the pointing vector doesn't care if it's in the axon or it's in the photon. It's just going to give you whatever electric fields are there. We're going to give you the pointing vector. I can get around this and start talking about the energy in the photon by saying that my magnetic field has some slow adiabatic drop-off. So basically, my experiment is not infinitely sized. My magnetic field is going to adiabatically decrease. And that's going to mean that my interaction here is going to adiabatically switch off. And if this is very slow compared to the other scales in the system, it's not going to affect anything. So then I can just talk about the energy in this propagating wave in a way that doesn't kind of violate anything. Um, 
this basically just gives you a half EA squared. Um, so my power in photons per unit area is just the density of the axions uh, GA gamma. Where this is just using that A squared, uh, the amplitude of the axion field times its mass over two gives you the density in axions. So this is something you can derive for yourself, but it's just kind of a, 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 a result of scalar field theory. Um, so this is one picture of, of imagining this. I didn't really think about the axion at all. I just thought, okay, I've got some electric fields here that are caused by some virtual current, and this is what I get. Um, the other picture you could use to think about, well, there are a few others, but one of the other pictures you could use is this mixing picture. So in this picture, you would say, I've got some axion-like propagation state, and that's going to be trying to come into my system. So we're going to call that axion in, and that's going to be pure axion, because it's coming in from this mirror where there's no mixing with the photon or the, the mixing is essentially infinitely suppressed. So I have a pure axion coming in. It's going to go out, and it's going to be a propagation state, but now it's got some, some mixing. So it's GA. So there's some mixing now, so it's got some interaction state. And in theory, there's some probability that it's also going to reflect as a pure state again. And I can also have um, propagating photon-like states, which is, again, going to have some small mixing. And I want to work out how much photon propagation state do I get from my initial axion propagation state? Now the mathematics of this actually turn out to be very similar, but if you do this to everything lowest order, then the probability of the axion getting transmitted, so say there's A in has some amplitude which is A, that's exactly the same amplitude as the transmitted axion. So basically the axion goes right through a barrier, to first order, it does not see the barrier, it does not care about the barrier, there is no barrier to the axion. And this reflected axion is nothing. Uh, at second order, this is not true, but you have to do everything at second order and take care of things. Um, if I want to, oh, there's no minus sign here. And if I want to match these boundary conditions again, I can solve for my photon propagation state and my photon propagation state then is this. Whereas now this was like an A, remember this is, I wrote down these mixing equations in the vector potential rather than the electric field. So if I write down E gamma, then this is just G A gamma E A. So it's exactly the same as in the other picture. Mathematically this makes sense because there's linear order version of this gives you the exact same picture. Um, but again, you can, you're coming, out, coming to it from a different way of thinking. And this is kind of useful when you're talking about higher order effects or velocity effects or things like this. Um, and the electric fields are the same, so you should expect that they have the exact same power in them. So these should not surprise you that they agree. They're both purely classical calculations, so if they give different answers, I've done a bad job. Um, the quantum field theory version is, in some sense, less trivial that it agrees. There's also the picture here is very different. Um, when I was looking at these two cases, it looks like everything happens at the boundaries. So all of it was coming down to this, uh, what do I put it? The, these boundary conditions, and all the action seems to happen at the interface. In my quantum mechanical picture, I was doing an integral over all of space. 
and somehow these give the same answer. The short version of this is partly that the pointing vector shows that you have power generated in a larger volume, uh, so it's not really a purely boundary effect. Um, but you can also still see that they just explicitly agree. Um, so the tricky part of this one now is what is EK? So I can't just put a plane wave here now because a plane wave would, go would try and go through the mirror and that's not a solution to this system. So a photon wave function is actually described by, I can send some, some photon in and the, then it's gonna get exactly reflected back with this minus phase. So E in equals minus E out because you have to satisfy the boundary conditions at the, the, the mirror. So I can write my EK, my full photon wave function, as a sine of KX. So this is also a little bit different. This photon here is not the thing that's produced by the axion. It's the free photon wave function. So it's the wave function of the photon in the absence of the axion. In these other cases, I solved for Maxwell's equations and I found basically the combined wave function of the entire system. And this, so in this sense, we're piecewise doing it. Um, again, integrating this, uh, so we, have, we write down this matrix element again. So you have a GA gamma. Again, some volume integral, it's not a, it's not a surface effect. And you might be slightly worried again how you do this oscillatory integral. So if I integrate from zero to infinity of two sine kx, and I keep in mind that I'm assuming this, I've got some end to my magnetic field so it doesn't go on forever, then the oscillatory part doesn't come into this integral. So I can just say that this is twice, uh, well it's basically two over k, which is two over omega. So I can do this integral quite, quite easily in this case, even though it's technically oscillatory. Um, so, to connect now, I need to work out what is the flux of photons that I would expect out of this. Because again, I don't have a pure classical wave, I just have a probability of conversion. So I said before that this uh, normalization volume can be kind of interpreted like a number density. So essentially, if I have this, this inverse lifetime divided by the area over which I have my detector, then that should tell me something like uh, the flux of photons. So this lifetime over area is then GA squared B squared VMA squared. Um, and to turn this into a flux, I need it times by the, essentially the number of axions. Uh, and I can turn that into a, into a density by dividing by the mass. And if I want to turn that into a power, per unit area, the power is the mass times the flux, that gives you the amount of energy, and then you get exactly the same thing, rho A squared. So you can see that despite the fact that these all have very different kind of physical pitches in mind when you're trying to do the calculation, some of them are coming from pure quantum field theory, others are purely classical, they always give you the same answer. Um, so this was the last example that I planned. Um, hopefully that gives some clarifications about some of the techniques that people use to solve these things. Again, this was a lecture more about means than ends. Uh, 
if you want to deal with probably the most exploited axon coupling, uh, you need a little bit of flexibility because you're going to find that this thing crops up in basically every circumstance that people look for axions. So, yeah, if you have any questions or if you want me to expand about anything, please uh, let me know. Yes? You mentioned the neutron star magnetic field. Yes. Uh, is there a carbon emission for that or is it better? Uh, this is a little bit tricky. The problem is twofold. So, the kind of calculation I showed you there before, you can generalize that for an anisotropic media. You can take all this stuff into account. There are a couple of things that are very difficult to take into account. One of them is what you might call curvature. So this calculation assumed that your trajectories are along straight lines, but and the axon will go approximately up to gravitational curving along a straight line. But if your medium's curving, your photon is curving, and that's really hard to do analytically. Um, the other one is turbulence. The difficult and then the difficulties with doing it computationally is these are very long volumes compared to the wavelength. So a convergent region can be, you know, hundreds of meters long and a wavelength which is a tiny fraction of that. So that's very difficult computationally. And then also nobody has any goddamn idea what neutron star magnetospheres look like. So even if you could do it, you don't have a good model to put in. Um, so the systematics on that are not trivial. Yes. So it depends a little bit. Um, in general, people use different software. Oh, you can use a commercial solution, something like Comsol. Um, generally, the more practical these systems are for normal engineering, the less mold malleable they are. So the really engineering focused ones will only accept what they consider to be physical materials and a volume current that doesn't care about anything else in the system is not physical under normal electromagnetism. Uh, if you go to something like Comsol, it'll allow you to just put in some arbitrary thing. Uh, there are also open source options. There's something that people at MIT did called MEEP, which is fully open source, so you can program in your own axion electrodynamics if you want to. Yeah, you can put in your modified Maxwell equations and then you can use its inbuilt solving techniques. Uh, the downside to that is it probably is not quite as powerful as some of the more commercial solutions where they've got bigger budgets to optimize some of these stuff. Um, the limiting factor for most of them tends to be RAM. Uh, once you get even a slightly large system, you need like 700 gigabytes of RAM, otherwise it's just not going to be able to uh, essentially mesh the system. Uh, and it also has a lot of trouble with dealing with anything that's very small scale compared to the wavelength. So if you have lots of fine structure, you're just not going to be able to resolve that in your system. So they're very useful for aiding experiment design and things which are like a relatively decent finite volume, so less than tens or twenties of wavelengths. Anything that's much larger than that or more fine than that, you're kind of screwed. And honestly, then you should just, if it's a device, you should just build it and measure it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just try it. Um, yeah. <laughs> 